Hello everyone. So now we will begin with the titration of an acid and a basic amino acid. But before that we are using a separate form of the titrant that is NaOH out here. We are preparing another set of NaOH and for that we have to do the methods from the beginning. Like first we have to prepare oxalic acid, then we have to prepare fresh NaOH and then HCl and followed by proper standardization. So initially we have to prepare the primary standard that is oxalic acid, then NaOH, then we have to standardize the NaOH which is in nature a secondary standard using the primary standard oxalic acid and after we um, standardize the NaOH we will standardize the HCl and now NaOH is required for titration that is we will be adding NaOH dropwise to the acidic or basic amino acid as we have seen earlier in case of glycine. And on the other hand, the amino acid initially is needed to be protonated. For that, we will be using a standard or rather um, uh, HCl which will be standardized using NaOH. Initially, we will begin with weighing our oxalic acid and preparing the primary oxalic acid solution. The oxalic acid we will prepare is 250 ml 0.2 normal oxalic acid. For that, we will require 2.25 gram of oxalic acid. Now this is the oxalic acid we will be using for preparation. As we can see this is the digital balance and here this is the butter paper. This butter paper here we will put the sample and we will weigh the amount of oxalic acid. Here we can see that it is showing a some amount of weight of the butter paper. So we have to tear this. Every time you use any uh, base like a butter paper or any epin drop or anything or any vial, initially always do tearing. The tear part of the instrument is very much essential. Now I will be adding around 2.25 gram of oxalic acid. Here we can see the value is actually 0. So once this value reaches 0, we will start adding the solid oxalic acid. We are using a clean spatula. The spatula I am using has been washed with double distilled water and after that with acetone and dried. And uh, after that I am just cleaning with a uh, clean tissue paper. Now I will be adding 2.25 gram of oxalic acid. So this is the oxalic acid. Add oxalic acid very carefully. Here we can see the oxalic acid crystals. It's already 2 gram 1.9. It's around 2.1. And a pinch I'll be adding out here. It's 2.7. So the amount of oxalic acid we require is 2.25 so it's around 2.27 so we'll keep it up till here as we all know that whatever the exact weight we require we have to take a small amount of an excess weight. Now we will take the spatula and we'll again clean it but before that we have to transfer this sample to the volumetric flask of 250 ml volume. Now we will take the oxalic acid in the clean and dried volumetric flask. And here we can see this volumetric flask has been uh, dried and it is very much essential to keep it dried and free from any sort of moisture or water. And similarly we should also use this funnel. So what happens is that you can't actually take this sample and pour it directly through its mouth because some amount of sample might fall from this volumetric flask. So it's better to always use a funnel out here. The funnel should also be clean and dry. Now we have kept this funnel in this mouth of the volumetric flask. 
here we have taken out the sample here we can see the measured oxalic acid we'll carefully transfer this in the volumetric flask through this funnel what happens is that here we can see the sample is out here in the funnel in the mouth of the funnel it's stuck so how to transfer this uh, sample out here you can actually pour double distilled water through it so here we have double distilled water we are adding it in the funnel like this way and this is one of the very small and important method out here you have to just add water in a circular manner in the mouth of the funnel so that whatever sample is stuck around the funnel will flow through it always try to add water through this funnel because you never know whether some amount of sample is still stuck there in the side of the funnel or not so at least half of this volumetric flask should be filled with water after adding it through this funnel now we have added a portion of water double distilled water in the volumetric flask the next method is to remove this funnel and put this lid over it and gently stir this one one important thing is that don't fill up to this 250 ml mark out here and then start stirring because we basically can't uh, vibrate this entire solution freely in the if it's completely filled so better to make it half filled with double distilled water whatever solvent you prefer and then gradually stir it entire sample may not be dissolved out here and again i will be adding double distilled water through the funnel so this is a periodic step we have to add water in portions and stir it gently and gradually you would see that the crystals of oxalic acids starts to dissolve if you see any time that the solution the solute in the solution does not dissolve you can go for ultrasonic uh, bath and sometimes people go for heating but it's better not to heat samples because you may not know what might what the reaction might take place if you start heating any sort of sample without knowing its chemical properties so here we can see the solution is almost clean and oxalic acid is dissolved in this double distilled water now here we have to fill it up to this mark in every volumetric flask which we all used there is a mark for 100 ml there is one mark the 250 ml there is a mark we'll fill up to this mark to make it to 50 ml and one small thing to remember out here while using a volumetric flask don't add 250 ml of water in through a measuring cylinder directly to it and then add sample or first add sample then directly add to 50 ml of water don't add entire volume of water to it because due to volume error which we all study in our chemistry lab classes due to volume error the 
total volume of the solution might increase a bit. So it's better to add sample, then add little bit of double distilled water, and then you dissolve, you try to dissolve it as much as possible, then fill the volume totally with double distilled water up till the mark. Now I will pour double distilled water directly to it. It's taking a bit some time, so you can add double distilled water directly. If you see that uh, it's taking a lot of time to fill the volume, like for 250 ml or 500 ml, you can avoid this nozzle and directly add double distilled water, provided you are confident enough. I will leave it till here because this narrow neck it fills up very fast so I will prefer to pour water through this nozzle. Up to a mark here. So this mark is very thin and it's not always clearly visible when you are seeing it from a distance. So whenever you would be using any sort of volumetric flask, you can easily see the mark graduated out there. So we have prepared oxalic acid of 0.2 normal and this is the solution of oxalic acid. Now this is the primary solution of oxalic acid. We will now shift to NOH solution. The NOH we will prepare is actually 250 ml of 0.5 normal NOH and this is actually the rough concentration of NaOH. So we have prepared oxalic acid which is the primary standard. Now we will weigh NaOH, we will weigh 5 gram of NaOH which is actually the secondary standard and it will be estimated, the exact strength of NaOH will be estimated using oxalic acid. So we have kept this butter paper out here and we will tear this. Keep in mind, until and unless it goes to zero, you have to just be patient. So yeah, it's zero now. So we have again cleaned this spatula, okay, and we will be adding NaOH. Prefer not to use this NaOH beads using uh, your hand. Always take NaOH using a spatula. We'll be taking around 5 gram of NaOH. It's 4, four gram and one more is required, 4.3. NOA generally absorb moisture, so prefer not to keep this bottle open for a long time. And small bit, it will do 5.2 and uh, a small amount. Because the weight of NOA bead is not exactly the weight it should be because it had already absorbed some amount of moisture. So whatever is showing out here like 5.3, it may not be 5.3341 or rather much less than that, the exact weight. So sometimes what happens is that whenever this uh, bottle, this 
in which bottle is opened and closed, it absorbs moisture from time to time. So its exact weight actually increases. Now here we have again taken this volumetric flask. It is a 250 ml volumetric flask. And I have kept again a clean funnel. Now I will transfer these NOH beads. So here we'll be adding double distilled water in a similar fashion through this funnel. Try to avoid your bare hand from here because whenever water is added to any which the reaction is highly exothermic. So heat is generated. A small amount of NOH is still here in the mouth of this funnel. So you have to add a few amount of water. Now here we can see this volumetric flask is almost half filled with double distilled water and this funnel is almost uh, clean like uh, more or less most of the NOH has been passed and been dissolved in double distilled water and still we will be adding small amount of double distilled water again through this funnel like the previous way we will be closing this lead and again stirring it NOH dissolves very easily in water. So here we can see that the solution is clear out here. Now we can add the remaining of this uh, volumetric flask with double distilled water. I'll be carefully adding double distilled water to it without the nozzle. It's better to add double distilled water without this nozzle till this part of this, this uh, round region of the volumetric flux and this neck of this volumetric flux always use this nozzle. So you can, you can add double distilled water without this nozzle up till this mark, the round part of this volumetric flask, but prefer to add water using this funnel so that this uh, level that is the mark which is there in the volumetric flux does not cross. So it's safe to use this nozzle because once you reach this neck, it fills the volumetric flux fills at a very fast rate. So here we are adding very slowly, slowly, slowly and now it has reached this graduated mark and we are done with this NOH solution. So we have completely filled this volumetric flux with double distilled water. This is the NOH solution 
of strength around 0.5 normal. So, we will measure the exact strength of the solution using titration method. Now, we will use this NaOH to carry out titration of basic and acetic amino acid and the acetic amino acid we will be using today is glutamic acid and the basic amino acid we will be using today is lysine. So, we will measure each of this individual amino acids. One interesting thing to note out note down here is that people may ask you how many bits of NaOH have you taken while measuring 5 gram of NaOH. Uh, actually you do not basically count the number of bits while measuring any uh, chemicals or something like that. But generally what happens is that uh, it is a very common question the weight of each bit of NaOH. Basically it is 0.15 gram for each half bit and one full bit that is one half one half becomes 0.3 gram. So, it is exactly not the same, but it is close to one another like if you do not have any weighing balance and you have to measure NaOH of 5 gram. So, what you can do? You can actually measure the number of beads required for actually for measuring the 5 gram of NaOH. Now, let us see what is the weight of half bead of NaOH. Now, we will take one half bead of NaOH. So, what is meant by half bead? We have all seen NaOH beads, it is basically half spear. So, we can see a spear, it is a round okay. and this is half spear is basically one half bead of NaOH. Now, this here we can see one half bead of NaOH, we have taken it in a spatula, we have kept one butter paper, we will tear this one 0. Now, we will place Okay, we will tear once it is 0, we will place this half bead here in this butter paper. Here we can see it is actually 0 0.1660 gram. So, it is not exactly 0.15 gram, it is basically 0 0.1660 gram. So, it is a bit more than that. Now, let us take another half bead. So, we have taken another half bead and we are putting another half bead out here. Here we can see the weight changes to 0.3276 gram. So, it is a bit more than 0.3 gram. So, what is full bead? Here inside we can see above this butter paper on the butter paper here we can see one half bead and one half bead, one half spear and another half spear over it. So, it is basically a spear and two half bits make one full bead. So, basically the question is how many full bids make, uh, how many full bids are there in 5 gram of NaOH or how many half bids are there in 5 gram of NaOH. Solve it and write down the answer, I will not tell it correctly. Now, we will weigh L lysine out here we can see this L lysine, it is actually L lysine hydrochloride, here we have to always note down before measuring. So, we will measure actually 100 ml and 0.1 molar lysine solution and for that we will require around 1.5 gram of lysine. So, we have taken again this butter paper out here, we will tear this one. Again I have cleaned this spatula and I will be adding life enough around 1.5 gram. Here we are preparing 0.1 molar solution you can actually vary this amount, you may not prepare 0.1, you may prepare lower than that like this 0.1 molar becomes 100 millimolar, you can prepare like 10 millimolar or something like that whichever is convenient for your work. Sometimes it is better to use a spatula which is bigger than this one. 
so it depends upon your convenience but spatula with this small mouth is generally good for your measurements for like uh, very um, uh, critical measurements like in a decimal places or for that the smaller spatula is preferred so it's always better to use a small spatula but you can go for larger spatula if your weight is around 4 gram 5 gram or around 10 gram it's almost 4 4.6 uh, 5.2 so again I am taking a small amount of excess lysine out here this is the 100 ml volumetric flask which you have cleaned and dried and again this is the clean funnel we will take out this lysine carefully out here And again, we will pour this through this funnel. Always we can see a small amount of this compound, whether it is or anything, is stuck in this butter paper. So it's better to use excess, a bit excess amount of the sample which you are measuring each and every time. Now here you can see I have taken this lysine out here. I'll be adding double distilled water through this funnel. Although we can see the more or less all the lysine have passed through this funnel into this volumetric flask still it's preferred to add water through this funnel sometimes the solute might stick there in this mouth of the funnel so add water this way and stir it gently more or less the solution is clear only only thing we can see a small lump of this lysine is still there in the solution and we'll be adding a bit of double distilled water once more to this funnel don't pour directly just encircle in this way like you were revolving ar around this mouth of the uh, volumetric flask almost half of this volumetric flask is filled double distilled water And here we can see the solution is almost clean or some of the residues are still there. We have to dissolve it completely. Now for 100 ml volumetric flask, prefer not to add water directly without this nozzle. Yeah, there is a mark a very faint mark is there and 
I will put this slowly till this mark. Now we are done with this lysine solution. It's basically 0.1 molar lysine of 100 ml. Now we will measure glutamic acid. The next thing we will be measuring is L-glutamic acid. Now the concentration of glutamic acid is again 0.1 molar similar to lysine and 100 ml. For that we require around 1.3 gram of this glutamic acid. So we will tear this one. I have cleaned the spatula. Now I will be adding 1.3 gram of glutamic acid. So it's 1.1 gram or no, it's just below 1.1. Now it's 1.1 gram. We will be taking 1.3 gram, a bit excess. So what basically happens is that we will transfer this glutamic acid again in a 100 ml volumetric flux, fill the volume again double distilled water till the mark and we will dissolve it. We might see at times it happens that glutamic acid is quite difficult to dissolve. For that we will go to ultrasonication method in which we will keep it in ultrasonic bath and let it dissolve for some time and then proceed for the experiment. So we have taken sodium hydroxide solution in this burette and uh, oxalic acid is there in the volumetric flask and we will take 10 ml of oxalic acid as previously we have seen using this pipette. So this pipette has been cleaned properly and we will gradually take the solution yeah the zero meniscus has been reached small amount yeah done now I will transfer this one in this clean and conical flask. After that, add one or two drops of phenylophthalene indicator. Now we will titrate this with sodium hydroxide solution. We will slowly titrate this oxalic acid with NaOH. We will be adding NaOH drop wise. and stir it gently. A faint pink color appears in the solution and once we stir it, it fades actually. Here we can see the faint pink color becomes completely permanent. Leave it for some time, stir it. If it fades away once again, then you will understand the endpoint is not here, but out here in this case, we can easily conclude that the endpoint has been reached because this pink color is persistent. Now we will note down the volume from here. And the volume that has been consumed of NaOH is around 1.7.
So, 1.7 ml of NaOH has been consumed in titrating oxalic acid solution. So, let us calculate the strength of NaOH using V1 S1 equal to V2 S2 method as we have done previously. We have calculated the concentration of sodium hydroxide. The concentration of sodium hydroxide is 1.11 normal. So, using this sodium hydroxide solution, we will measure the concentration of HCl solution. We have prepared this HCl solution, which is a dilute HCl solution. We will again take 10 ml of HCl. and transfer it in this conical flask. I am using again a new conical flask. This, this conical flask has been cleaned properly. And after that, we will give one to two drops of phenolophthalene indicator. As we know, phenolophthalene is colorless in acidic solution and pink in basic solution. One small thing to note down here is that why we do not use NaOH in, in the conical flask and acidic in the burette. Basically, there are lots of reasons out there. One reason which you can basically think at this moment is that if you add phenolophthalene in this conical flask containing NaOH, it will completely turn pink. And once you start adding HCl solution, the pink color will gradually fade. But sometimes what's happened due to persistent of vision, you can't actually discriminate when the pink color completely fades from pink to colorless. That will become dark pink, light pink, very light pink, very, very light pink, and then colorless. And that very, very light pink or what we can say slight light tinge of pink color and colorless solution is not very easy to detect with our eyes. So it's better to use acidic solution or acid in this conical flask, add phenolphthalein and you can very well distinct from colorless to pink rather from pink to colorless. So, it is better to take acidic solution here in this conical and base in the burette. So, let us proceed for titration. Once we have done our first titration, we can do two things. Once, one is that we can fill this burette again up to 0 mark with NaOH and the second thing is that we can mark this one that is 1.8 ml and we mark this as V initial VI and we will note the V final that is the point where the pink color appears. Okay. So, this one for, for my case VI is actually 1.8. So, let us start with the titration. We will again slowly add NaOH. You can go on adding this solution, you can go on adding the base out here freely, but once the pink color appears, try to add drop wise. Here a faint pink color has started appearing and but again it disappears. So, the end point has not yet reached. Here we, we shall approach the end point soon, you are asking one or two drops, okay, one drop, two drops, here. Here we can see in two drops, we have reached this pink color. So, this is the end of our titration and now we will note the volume, that is the final volume, that is Vf. Vf from here 
is around 9.3. Our VI is actually 1.8 and that is the volume initial volume and the final volume is 9.3. So, it is better to see the level of this graduation at your eye level like this way. Do not look at it in this way like in this or in this or it is better to always take this meniscus in your at your eye level. Okay. It is 9.3. So, we will do the calculation and measure the concentration of HCl solution. We have calculated it using the V1 S1 equal to V2 S2 part and uh, the concentration of HCl will be calculated out here is 0 0.832 normal. So, we have initially calculated a standardized NaOH using pre standard, the primary standard oxalic acid solution. The secondary standard NaOH has been estimated okay. and using this standardized NaOH, we have measured the concentration of HCl. Now, we will go for titration of lysine and glutamic acid. Now, we have taken lysine solution in this 100 ml beaker and we will be adding HCl to it. Why will be adding HCl? As we have seen in case of glycine, we have to first protonate completely this amino acid. For lysine, we have to again protonate it. For this, we will protonate it with using HCl. The HCl we have standardized just a few minutes ago. So, what is the concentration of HCl? It is around 0 0.832 normal. And what is the volume of HCl required? For that, we have to actually calculate the number of moles of this amino acid out here. Uh, in case of 0.1 molar 100 ml lysine, the number of moles of lysine present and a number of moles of HCl required to protonate it. In this case, we will be adding initially 12 ml of HCl, 0.83 to normal HCl and let us check out the pH after that. Now, this is a 10 ml pipette. Initially, we will pipette out first 10 ml. Add it here. Now, again, we will pipette out 10 ml. But here we will add only 2 ml because total volume we have to do is 12 ml. Carefully add 2 ml out here. Done. So, we have prepared this lysine solution, protonated lysine solution and we will check its pH value. We will be titrating the lysine solution with sodium hydroxide and we will counting a number of drops and we will see the change in pH. But while during the graph plot, we will be plotting pH versus the volume of NaOH. For that, we need to count the number of drops corresponding to a particular volume of NaOH. How to proceed for that? Initially, we have to know the volume corresponding to one single drop and for that we will do this type method. For that what we will do? We will take this uh, sodium hydroxide in this burette. Here we have filled this burette. She will be counting the number of drops out here and I will be monitoring the change in volume. So, the change in volume from 0 to 1 ml, the number of drops associated with 1 ml we will calculate and then we will see one drop corresponds to how much volume. Okay? So, are you ready? Okay. So, let us start. One drop. Okay, the volume is decreasing. It is gradually approaching 1 ml and I am slowing down it in one way of course. Okay, done. It's about 20. 20, right? So, generally it is the standard uh, 
number of drops. So, 1 ml corresponds to 20 drops. Now, we have taken one reading, we will again repeat it. I will again go from 1 to 2 ml and kindly count the number of drops. Okay? So, let us start, we will see again from 1 to 2 ml. So, we can see again it is going from this meniscus is going from 1 to 2 ml. It is going and I am about to stop this one. Okay. Done. 18. 18. So, in one reading it is showing 20 drops, in the other one it is 18. So, we can take the average, we can also repeat this one. So, we can take the average from 18 and 20 and see the number of drops corresponding to 1 ml or rather number of uh, what is the volume corresponding to a single drop. Now, we will proceed for the pH metric titration of lysine solution. We have taken lysine in a beaker, we have kept it over a magnetic stirrer out here and dipped the pH electrode into it. And we should be careful with the magnetic bar that it that do not touches the pH bulb. Now, we can see the pH of this solution, basically the protonated solution is around 2.27. This is the NOH, we will be adding NOH drop wise to it and we will record the pH corresponding to number of drops we are adding. She will help me with noting down the pH values. Generally, it is convenient for two partners to carry out this experiment because uh, you should be careful in adding these drops in the solution and one should minutely note down the pH change during this experiment. So, let us start with this experiment. Now, now we will be adding 2 drops of NaOH. And the pH changes a bit. It is 2.25. Now, again 2 drops, that is total 4 drops, and the pH change is not that much. Out here, the pH did not change here, it is same. Now, I am added another 2 drops, it is 6 drops. So, here you can basically go on adding or uh, you can actually add 2 drops and wait for the solution to be homogeneous. Another 2 drop. The pH change is very slow in this case. We should wait in order to so that the solution gets stabilized. Reading. Here we can see the increase in pH is not that much, with change in volume of NaOH. Point two nine. Again, two drops I am adding. Two point two nine, two point three zero and two nine. It's so three zero. Three one, three two. Now I will be adding four drops. 
वन टू थ्री एंड फोर टू पॉइंट थ्री थ्री एगेन फोर ड्रॉप्स पॉइंट थ्री फोर थ्री फाइव फोर ड्रॉप्स टू पॉइंट थ्री सेवन इट्स टू पॉइंट फोर जीरो अगेन आई एडिंग फोर ड्रॉप्स This one is basically a buffer zone. That's why that pH change is very negligible out here. Two drops, fifty-two. Again, four drops. One for eight. Six drops. Now again four drops. Two point five four. Now I'm adding two drops. Okay. Four drops. Again, four drops. Two point five eight, five nine. One six one. Four drops. Six six, two point six. Here we can see the change in pH comes to around two point six nine, from two point around two point two. Two. Three, four, two point seven one, two, three, four. Two point seven five. Four it's two point seven nine. Four drops. 
eight four again four drops two point nine one It's three point three zero. So here we can see a straight jump from three point one seven to three point two four three. I'm adding two drops. Three point two, uh, two six. Again, four drops. Two drops. Three point four six. Two drops. Three point five four. Two drops. Three point five five. Again, four drops. I give. After adding like two or four drops, we should leave the solution to stir for some time in order to get homogenized. Because once we can see the increase in pH is a very abrupt and again it decreases in certain cases. Now two drops. Three point nine zero. We can gradually see a straight jump from three point seven six value. And again, adding two drops. It's four point one two. Again, two drops. So here we can see the fluctuation or the change from 4.1 to 4. Point almost 4.5, 4.6. It will vary. We have to keep it, give it some time for stabilization. 4.45 or 4.4. Again, I'm giving two drops. So here the inflection point. Somewhere around here, we can see it has attained something around six range. Now it's decreasing. So the pH in the region of the bulb actually changes in the first stage, but however, after homogenization, the pH again decreases. It's five point one one. Or one zero. Again, two drops. Or again, a rapid jump from five point one to around six point nine, and again, it decreases. Basically, what happens is that if this is the bulb of the pH meter, here locally NOH accumulates. In this case, here NOH accumulates locally near the bulb of the pH meter. That's why, at initial cases, it detects like once you have added NOH out here, it reaches the bulb of the pH. It detects pH value of around suddenly from 5.5 to 7.5. But after that, once these NOH molecules are 
homogeneous is in a solution so the concentration of NMH near the bulb decreases again and again we can see a gradual lowering of the pH values so it's better don't note down the pH values immediately after adding this give it some time for stabilization once it reaches a fixed pH then note it down so it's 6.76 we'll be adding again two drops If you wish, we can go on adding one drop in this case also. It's 7.22. Let's add one drop here. Okay. So I'm adding one single drop. We're almost, we have almost passed the inflection point, I guess. We have added one drop out here. Seven point. Three, six, and again one drop. I'm adding. So on seven point four four. Talking about seven point four four pH, as you can all relate, this is the physiological pH basically. So in this experiment, we can say we have reached a very interesting point out here, pH seven point four. Anyways, we have to go a bit ahead from here. Okay, I'm adding two drops. And seven point five eight. Again, two drops. Seven point seven one. Now we are again adding two drops. Seven point eight. After that, it will again reach a buffer region where the change in pH will be very slow. It's gradually heading there. Again, two drops. We have seen initially the change in pH was very slow in the range of 0.01 or 0.2. Then again, it went in the range of 0.5 and, uh, and again in the range of 1 value one unit and those were the inflection points now again it's changing in the range of point 1 point 1 point 5 again two drops now here we can see the increases like <coughs> point 0.5 units from here which was initially in during the inflection point, it was around 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Again, two drops. Now here we can see it's again slowed down out here. And in two drops. We have to take this to a value nearly of pH 12. Now I am adding 4 drops. So here we are at a buffer range. So we can increase the number of drops. So I have added 4 drops. 8.25. Again 4 drops. 8.30. Again, I'm adding four drops. So here the change in pH is basically in the range of 0.05 or 0.6 units. Again, four drops. Four and four six and four drops.
Okay, now I'm increasing the number of drops. I'm adding six drops. One, two, three, four, five, six. So here you can see that uh, upon adding six drops also the number of the change in the pH value is still not that much. Two, three, four, five, six. Slowly it has reached a value 8.8. So here we can see the change in pH is very slow in the, again in the buffer region. Again six drops. Six drops. Eight drops. Nine point zero six. No, eight drops. Nine point one two. I'll be adding four drops. Nine point one five and point six three. Again, ten drops. It's uh, now ten point one two, and we have to take it up to twelve. Ten drops. It's 10.25. Now I'm adding 20 drops. So for 20 drops, the pH change is around from 10.25 to 10.40. Again, 20 drops. 10.58. It's 10.7, 10.80. It's uh, 20 again. 11.02 it's 10 11.10 again 20 11.30 and we are close to 12 now again 20 10.5 and again 20 near 12 we'll go with last 20 drops Actually, the first PK is in the range of around uh, 2 to 3, whereas in the second one uh, is in the range of around 10. So after reaching 10 or 10.8, we can gradually move up to 11.5 or 12. Now 10 drops. So it's 11.96 and final 10 drops. So it's 11.99 and uh, it's 12 basically. So we will end this titration till here and we'll now plot the change in pH against the volume which we can calculate from the number of drops and we can find the pK1, pK2 and the pI for lysine. So we have seen uh, the preparation of sodium hydroxide, NaOH, 
that is sodium hydroxide, then uh, oxalic acid and how sodium hydroxide was standardized as an oxalic acid and that standard NOH was used to again standardize HCl and now the lysine solution was protonated using HCl and then uh, gradually we added NOH and titrated it and we have seen the two inflection ranges. We have noticed the first one, but somehow we have uh, could not actually monitor the second one or the other inflection points cannot be monitored using this pH because they are very small and uh, we have carried out from pH range 2 to around 12 and from here we will plot our uh, pH metric curve from which will be the pH in the y axis and the volume of NOH in the x axis and from there a similar graph like this uh, we can obtain for lysine and from there we can calculate the pk1, pk2, pkr and uh, from these three we have, we have to calculate the pi for lysine. In a similar way we can carry out for glutamic acid or anything or aspartic acid whatever the acidic amino acid may be and in that case also we will get another p1, pk1, pk2, pkr for uh, glutamic and aspartic acid also. In a similar way, now we will get another pk1, pk2 and pkr for aspartic acid or glutamic acid also and we can calculate its pi from that values. So, in this experiment we can see how to calculate the pi of amino acid using NOH in a pH metric titration method.